ditty takes me back to the days of the bounty. Days in hell, nights in paradise, then days in hell again. Michael, tell us the story of the bounty. I've never heard the truth of it. Yes, Michael, you old son of a gun. I'd sell me breeches to hear the truth of that mutiny. You remember? You said the tune you played just now brought back memories. and the temper of Bly, and soon we became only a cargo of gloom. The heat of the equator burnt through our very hides, and always Bly found fault. I know the Cooper to be a damned infernal liar. Now take these orders, Mr. Christine, and see that they are carried out. just begun. Well, you ship for adventure, young cocko. <laughs> adventure. <laughs> Lord, what blinded fools we are. Aye, you're right, fighting Jack. There's been black and bloody doings these last few days. <laughs> but if Bly, don't find his cheese. Well, <laughs> things will get no better. <laughs> and on the next Banyan day, butter only will be served to your low deck swabbers. There'll be no more cheese until mine is returned to me. Your choice of seamen surprises me, Mr. Christian. You've picked a bunch of thieving jellyfish. <laughs> there is a feeling on this craft like creeping murder. Don't you feel it yourself? Something in the wind. Something in the creak of the timbers. Oh. Our bread rations were then cut down and we were flogged for the slightest offence. I remember quite early in the voyage the lashing of poor Quinto. Hmm. 
Enough. Come on, water. was so meagre that we drew lots to see who should take it all. Many times we fought like wild beasts. Oh, no, 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 no. Give it to me! Family noise out there. If I may beg to say, sir, uh, the allowance of food is so small that, 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 that the men are drawing lots and, and fighting for it. The damned infernal scoundrels. I'll make them eat grass or anything they can catch before I've done with them. Send Mr. Christian to me. to the warm fairy land of Tahiti. Oh, the memory of those nights as we skimmed the sea all silver with moonlight and then at last saw land birds coming to meet us. And then one day... Tahiti! 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 Sculptured in a primitive climb, carried great canoes to the waterfront. Princess Titia, decked with garlands of frangipani, passes on her way to greet the men of the bounty. Their muscles that are shaped by the rippling pools they swim in.
from every little bay, Tahiti's people were running to meet us. sang to us a song of freedom, and we listened, thinking like misers, we could snatch for ourselves this most priceless of all man's wishes. <laughs> it took us six months to gather breadfruit in Tahiti.
we go. Why, God, I won't. I don't think Christian will either. You know, he's mad about a girl. <laughs> he's not the only man mad about a girl. <laughs> well, come on, mates. Here's to further months in hell. Yes, hell. Think of it. Mr. Christian, sit down. For the desertion of Churchill, Muspat, and Millard, I hold the mate of the watch responsible. You will have Hayward turn before the mast and put in irons for this. Sir, as an officer, I caution you. As a man, I ask you to bear more with the men. Six months was too long at Tahiti. Your sailors have left their hearts there at the cost of their reason. You are well informed, Mr. Christian. Are you stating the case of your men or that of yourself? Sir, I... Shut up! Your mad infatuation with that half-caste girl, Isabel, is the talk of the ship. It's a lie! Mr. Christian, you dare! Yes, sir! I dare! That night while we slept, Fletcher Christian, aided by only a handful of men, quietly seized the bounty. Not a shot was fired. Not a sound was heard. Are you with me in this adventure, Edward Young? Yes, sir. Then break out the arms. Immediately. It's a desperate act, Mr. Christian. Are you sure of what you're doing? Yes. All the starboard watch are asleep. And my men are already in Bly's cabin. Be gone. Ah. What's the meaning of this? Yeah, come on. Come on. What's your meaning? Come on. Let's rest Come on here. God, I have you on. I can take for them. Put that rope on. Up on deck. Mate! Mate! Wake up! Wake up! Damn you! Rouse yourself, fighting Jack! Turn out, men! Turn out! Rouse up! Now listen! All hands on deck! Mr. Christian has taken Lieutenant Bly prisoner! Prisoner! Aye, prisoner! And he's now in command of the bounty! Hey! Hey! Take it up, men! Steady, boy! Hold oh, that, Jack! Or I'll bust your head! Now get on deck! All of you, get on deck. Go on, go on. Come on. Get up. You, Christian, an Englishman and an officer, to have sunk so low. The Admiralty will see you all hang for this reason. <laughs> Like madmen, bewitched by Tahiti's soft guile, we sent Bly and eighteen of his loyal men adrift to suffer thirst and hunger on that endless sea. Then, as the darkness engulfed them, we turned to our young commander, calling Tahiti, Tahiti! We are! We are! I will carry you and land you wherever you please. I desire none to stay with me. I have only one favor to beg, that you grant me the bounty. Make fast the foresail and leave me to run before the wind. I have done such an act that I cannot stay at Tahiti. And I'll never live to be carried home, a disgrace to my family. Go where you will, Mr. Christian. We shall never leave you. We tried to make a colony on an island called Chubei. And what happened there? 
we drank heavily and fought over the women until Christian decided at the risk of his life to drive us from those accursed islands. We formed two parties, one to remain on Tahiti and risk capture, and the others to join Christian who planned to take the bounty into uncharted seas. Christian left Tahiti with eight of his mates, nine native men, and ten native women. self-made villains. So long as we live, we are hunted men. You exaggerate, sir. There be lovely islands of plenty where we can never be found. Aye, but unfortunately we cannot escape from ourselves, nor from our own contempt. The die has been cast, Edward Young, and there is no turning back. The future holds the most awful adventure of all. Worse than the gallows. So Christian and his hearties disappeared. Twenty years have passed and never a sound has been heard of them. Perhaps someday a lonely island will be found with a strange people living there. Then the rest of my story can be told. Tahiti today is a beautiful dream of the past. Along its golden strands, moving across its limpid pools, crooning down through its damp, scented forest, come the songs of yesterday, when this strange land below the sun was a world of one dreams, when its forests echoed to the maddening dance of primitives, or to the laughter and blasphemy of the ruthless pirate and carefree tar. 
These are still the scenes which in the roaring days made many an old shell back gasp. The great molten mountains, the glamorous lagoons, the valleys of shadow and cloud. This great lagoon is now the harbor of Papiti, Paris of the Pacific, where passionate pleasure and steaming commerce mix in a melting pot of color and creed. A divine creator has massed great clouds upon the island of Moria. Through the rigging of our ship, we can see Papiti sleeping under the noonday spell. of reflection lie the luxury yachts of millionaire and wealthy trader. Like mounds of snow in a tropic heaven, great cloud banks mass behind schooner spars. We move along the fringe of Tahiti's great lagoon, a haven without wave or tide. Only warm winds to make a music ripple and impress one's mind with memories that never fade. Along a lazy coral key, the schooners large and small, which plow their tracks to every corner of the vast Pacific, bringing home priceless pearls from the dangerous atolls, tortoiseshell, copra and vanilla, taking clothes and food to lonely outposts, many leaving their skeletons to bleach upon forgotten strands. This schooner, the White Feather, is being provisioned to take you down through the dangerous archipelago upon the same trail taken by Fletcher Christian when he left Tahiti with his mutineers, never to be seen again. A following wind filled the sails of the White Feather as the Chauvels left Tahiti to follow the Bounty's trail. We have now entered the doldrums, now running by motor power through a silver sea of sleep. First of the coral atoll shows up, a little fantasy of reef and sand. The fate of the bounty remained a mystery until a whaler, blown from its course, stumbled across a grim little island a thousand miles south of Tahiti. The discoverer of this island called it Pitcairn's Island and found it to be inhabited by a strange race of half-castes, the descendants of the bounty mutineers. These atolls, which are generally termed the Dangerous Isles, are 80 in number. With waving palms and beds of brilliant coral, they extend for a distance of nearly a thousand miles south from Tahiti. As dense shadows of palm, they pass by upon a heated sky. Many are large and populous. Others have only sand and strutting bosun birds. Solitude succeed solitude and lonely wrecks lie bleaching under a devouring sun. Grim reminders that we are traversing the most dangerous sea track on the globe. The miracle is that Fletcher Christian was able to keep clear of these treacherous isles. Line to England by Panama runs within 200 miles of lonely Pitcairn Island. By arrangement, the Chauvel was transferred to an ocean liner which was deflected from its course to call at Pitcairn. After 10 lonely days, Pitcairn appeared on the horizon. For the first time, a motion picture camera was to re record its shape and rugged outline. 
soon will be with the descendants of the mutineers living their life and sharing their hardships. Young Pitcairners have sighted the steamer. The arrival of a ship marks a red letter day for these isolated people who hurry to the waterfront to man their boats. They will take out fruit and souvenirs with which to barter for flour and any small comfort the steamer can spare. From the timber of wrecked ships and the small trees of Pitcairn, they have fashioned wonderful boats. Throughout four generations, the art of boat building has been handed down from the sailors of the Bounty. This tiny inlet is the only safe landing place on the rugged little island, the first boat bounds to sea, manned by a crew of the best oarsmen in the Pacific. For a brief hour, the steamer will link this lonely island to our civilization. boat slides to the steamer's side. Like a piece of cargo, Mrs. Chauvel was swung to the Pitcairn boat. She will be the first Australian woman ever to land on Pitcairn Island. closer to the island with its foaming seashore and precipitous wall and hear the crash of the surf, we realize how well Fletcher Christian had chosen his hiding place. A narrow passageway between rocks has to be negotiated before a landing can be made at Bounty Bay. Even during the calmest weather, a heavy surf rolls in and boats have to await their turn to ride upon the back of an incoming wave. After their battle with Old Man Sea, the island boats are drawn into sheds above the landing ramp to be safe from further onslaught. A community spirit not to be excelled elsewhere in the world makes light work of every task on Pitcairn. In their exile, these people cling very closely to each other, sharing their joys and sorrow and making light of their difficulties. From the outskirts of their village, we look down upon Bounty Bay. Ships Dunnage traded to the islanders for fruit is being carried to their village, 500 feet above the crashing surf. This timber will be used to build their homes and boats and will be equally divided among those who need it most. Adamstown's only village sprawls upon a ledge 500 feet above the sea. It is significant that this little village should look towards the sea as everything has come to it from the sea. Its homes have been built mostly from ships dunnage and the timber of wrecks, 
Every Pitcairn babe is born with a tang of salt water in its nostrils and the boom of the surf in its ears. A little village where life moves lazily by without rates or taxes or the need of money. Simple homes within whose walls are hearts that know of peace, unshaken by the distant rumblings of the world. This is Andy Warren, the grandson of a whaler who joined the Pitcairners 60 years ago. Mrs. Chauvel quickly entered into the life of the village, helping the women with their children, <laughs> regardless of youthful protest. <laughs> Pitcairn is a little utopia, with its luscious fruits and tropic flowers. The bounty brought the breadfruit to Pitcairn instead of to the West Indies, and sea captains have added their share to the varied collection of plants. This Pitcairn girl is weaving a straw hat from the dried leaves of the pandanus palm. pitchers to fill at the wells. This girl, a descendant of midshipman Young, is carrying a jar which came to Pitcairn on the bounty. Under the community system, all rations from passing steamers are divided equally among the 52 families of the island. At the courthouse, flour received from our steamer is being rationed. Here you get a good peep at the descendants of the bounty mutineers. In the majority of cases, the Tahitian type prevail. They are thin and strong and speak a language of their own, a mixture of Tahiti and broken English. The peace of Pitcairn today makes it hard to realize how terribly it was stained with crime and bloodshed. By the early struggle for supremacy between the mutineers and the men of Tahiti, when all excepting two mutineers succumbed to the clash of color. This is William Christian, the great grandson of Fletcher Christian. Fletcher Christian's son afterwards married a pure native girl who, as a baby, was brought ashore from the bounty in a barrel, and so the dark blood of the Christians predominates. William Christian is hoeing the same plot where Fletcher Christian was killed by the Tahitian men. These are the family plots of Pitcairn, in little fertile valleys, 1,000 feet above the sea. Here the mutineers and their pagan companions fought and killed each other until only one, John Adams, remained. He, by the aid of the Bounty's Bible, preached the gospel to the remaining women and children. Upon this site stood Fletcher Christian's first cabin. We now turn back the pages of history. I wonder how much longer it would be before those black dogs put a knife in our backs. I care not of it be tonight. Death would be a release from the remorse which dogs my footsteps day and night, night and day. Who do you talk to yourself about? Bly? Ah. He deserved his fate. No, my friend. Whatever Bly's faults, he was a brave British officer. And in my presence, I would still have you speak of him as such. John Adams has made a strange request. 
He has asked for the Bible, believing he can cleanse this spawning hell by preaching the gospel. O oh, blessed Lord, look with mercy on Pitcairn Island and upon the fathers of these little children who died in shameful strife. By the shedding of their blood, O oh Lord, strengthen us for the trials for the future in this isolation. People of Pitcairn, remember the Lord said, Come unto me, all ye that suffer. And little children, the Lord said, suffer little children to come unto me. From the humble services held by John Adams in a hut, has sprung the present-day church, a large building of two stories, the most pretentious in the village. There is no labor on the Sabbath, and church is held three times during the day. Every man who possesses a naval uniform wears it to church, when clothes of all descriptions are worn. for this church was cut from the trees of an island 200 miles from Pitcairn. These are three prominent church people, Roy Clark, Aunt Anne McCoy, and Dora Warren. Edwin Christian, the Beau Brummel of Pitcairn, talks with his wife after the morning service. In Pitcairn's smithy, old Benjamin Young, the great-grandson of Midshipman Young, is turning the bounty's vice, which is still doing service on the island today. Benjamin Young is 84 years of age and is one of the keenest men on Pitcairn. Aunt Anne McCoy, descendant of mutineer McCoy, is busy making a basket from the leaves of the pandanus palm. Her old fingers are almost as deft as those of the young people. A woman of the large Christian family spends her spare time hand-painting souvenirs made from coconuts. Edwin Christian is the spiritual leader of Pitcairn, his sterling qualities being an inspiration to all. When death comes to the Pitcairner, a tombstone is cut from the rocks washed smooth by the sea. Edwin Christian is here seen hewing a tombstone from a rock below the landing place. The stone ovens of the island are also made from these rocks. As long as the sea shall break upon Pitcairn, there is a name whose glory will never die and whose works will always remain, John Adams. Necessity has taught Pitcairn to be entirely self-supporting as the possibility of a steamer calling becomes more remote as modern commerce is speeded up. Here we see Pitcairners making their salt. Each family owns its saltwater pools on the seafront, where in rough shelters the water is boiled off, leaving a coarse-grained salt. This is the crude sugar mill of the island, which is used by each family to manufacture the juice, which takes the place of refined sugar. Every member of each family takes a turn at the wheel, and the only horse on the island 
is available to all under the community roof. Two families are busy at the arrow root mill. The roots of the plants are being grated preparatory to being ground to pulp. Marrow root is one of Pitcairn's staple food, and the young children are practically reared upon it and coconut milk. Little Viola Christian is a worthy example of Pitcairn's youngest generation. The roots are ground and the pulp is squeezed of its precious juices, which, when set, become arrowroot. The dried pulp goes back onto the land as fertilizer. Each family has its saw pit. This is the only method of sawing timber on the island. For community work, such as boat building and case making, each family does its share, and more than 30 saw pits will be in action at once. King, light work. There are no slackers upon this little island. Every man does his bit. One of the large canoes from the fishing fleet is being carried to the village for repairs. The Pitcairners take great pride in their boats, which are kept in excellent order. A young boat builder. They go to the sea in ships, at a very early age on Pitcairn. The large canoe is being caulked, ready for its battle against the tyrant sea and the uncertain currents of the Pitcairn fishing bank. The Pitcairners make their own violins and the girls give their hair as strings for the bows. There are no music masters on Pitcairn. They are all self-taught. Here's Pitcairn's Don Bradman making his own cricket bat. An attempt is made to educate the young Pitcairner who only goes to school for two hours before breakfast <laughs> and then spends the remainder of the day at play. The young men of Pitcairn are of excellent physique and although they climb and swim, they are great believers in physical culture. These young men are the product of inbreeding for a period of 160 years. Realizing this, the physique and mental capabilities of these people surprise one. We now leave the village to visit the rough coastline of Pitcairn. in from the surf, sweeping past mountain and palm. For thousands of miles, a lonely sea develops huge land swells, which break upon little Pitcairn with giant force, shaking the island from end to end. The roar of Pitcairn surf can be heard for many miles at sea, and ships will give it a wide berth.
Sheltered from the wind, the surf rolls in more lightly upon Bounty Bay. In all kinds of weather, rough or calm, Pitcairn's fishing fleet goes out. Altogether, there are 30 large fishing canoes, all built on Pitcairn. A Pitcairner is returning home with his fish. He will have to shoot the breakers. A great wave rushes to envelop him. He's on his back. Will he make it? No. Ah, he's over. And so are the fish. Another man comes in. He has his battle too. But succeed as they generally do. Bounty Bay, where the bounty, after being fired by mutineer Quintal, sank in flames, burying her shame from the eyes of man forevermore. Hearing from the pit kerners that a portion of the bounty's skeleton could still be seen at the coral bed of this bay, the Chauvels searched with cameras set in glass-bottomed boxes. Seaweed shall grow, the coral shall spread, and man... His work shall cease. So spoke the old priest of Polynesia. The bounty from its rotting timbers, we seem to hear spirit voices. And so, the seaweed covers memories of a day when man went straight to pleasure, glory or fortune without much meditation. Now we will land, and this time, climb the steep cliffs above the sea to visit the great swimming pool on Pitcairn. Through a giant gateway, the blue Pacific surges to refresh the waters of the most beautiful and fantastic swimming pool in all the world. A mirror of cool waters set behind great fairy casements of basalt, a sublime fantasy of rock and sea, a gift of the gods to Pitcairn. In a foaming sea, canoes of the fishing fleet glide by the Devil's Gateway as they return to Bounty Bay. We climb to a great wall of rock above the pool. A thousand years of pagan history is buried in a bed of coral rubble and shattered idols at the base of this cliff. There were men here in a stone age, making hammerheads and chisels of stone and etching their histories and beliefs upon the mountain sides. On this wall, Charles Chauvel discovers what is perhaps a heathen story of creation, as the sacred birds of old Polynesia are plainly outlined with the fruitful tree, the stars of the sky, and the fishes of the sea. We climb on to the higher peaks of the island and look down to the rugged coastline we have left behind. Each family owns its flock of goats, and they are earmarked just as we earmark our sheep. This is Goat House Mountain, on which can be seen Fletcher Christian's cave. By the aid of ropes, the camera party is now nearing the cave. In this cave, far above the sea, Fletcher Christian as a hunted and distracted man spent long periods away from the village longing for the sight of a sail. Back in the village, we come to Pitcairn's public notice board where all announcements are posted. If any person can give a reason why Alan Christian should not marry Eva Christian, 
Let him now speak or forever hold his peace. A Christian man desires to keep another Christian's daughter. Hence, the shower of rose petals and the passing of Pitcairn's admiral, chief engineers and stewards <laughs> in the uniform of numerous shipping lines. The second notice is a very different one. David Young's firstborn is failing hourly. The ship Matapopa is now due in these waters and its doctor can save David's child. Volunteers are needed to keep the beacon alight and to take turn at the wireless. Sometimes an expected steamer will pass by, not bothering to call at the little island and a Pitcairn life in need of medical attention will pass away. This night on the cliffs, a little band will watch and hope. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I found the Lord and he heard me. David! And... David! Do you think the ship will call? We can only hope and pray, Martha. As the good Lord wills, so shall it be. So shall it be. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him. And Any fireworks on deck tonight? No, it's as dead as a doornail down there tonight. The blonde's off colour, and it's had to see old dog. Oh, <laughs> thanks. I always did prefer medicine to wireless. You know, I should have been a doctor, Jim. You don't do so badly for yourself, you old blighter. Can you call the ship, Edgar? I don't think so, my love. And even if I did reach them, I don't think they'd come near Pitcairn. Oh, Edgar, I'm afraid the baby's failing. The angel of the Lord encampeth around all them that fear him and delivereth them. Oh, fear the no, Lord, no, for he that. is good. I can't stand anymore. Fear the Lord, ye faint heart. I want a doctor. Do you hear, David? A doctor. Martha. <laughs> Anything to report? Oh, nothing important. Someone was trying to get us. I think it was Pitcairn Island. But I, they faded right out. I haven't heard them since. Oh, Pitcairn is always bothering us about something or other. Well, it's no use them bothering us anyway. <laughs> the old man wouldn't venture near that lonely rock. Besides, we're pressed for time. Well, castle's yours, old man. Good night, Jim. Good night. They seem to be getting further away every minute. And even if I got them now, they wouldn't come. They lose too much time. Sorry, old man. But I've done my best, David. seen fit to pluck this blossom from our garden. Let us bear our burden as atonement for the past, and help us to lift up our eyes to thee 
with true Pitcairn courage, and to echo daily thy holy will be done.